Dear all, I'm very nice um, to be able to talk to you today. I am Marie Toussaint. I am a Green member, French member of the European Parliament, but I'm also a lawyer and an activist who has been fighting uh, for, well, more than decades now for the recognition of ecocide, but also for climate justice and the rights of nature. This all goes together. And I think this is the message that we are gathered here to send today. It is time to recognize ecocide. There is an emergency of sanctioning the gravest crimes against our planet. And this is of course linked to climate change. We are uh, leaving the 26th conference of the parties on climate change. And what we hear he here and today uh, from the youth, especially, and especially the youth from the global south, is that not enough is done in order to protect the climate. And the worst is that no one, neither the richest countries, nor the biggest companies and the most polluting companies, such as Total, for instance, and I will get back to that, are doing enough neither to prevent climate change and to stop their emissions, especially the fossil fuels, uh, but nor also to, uh, 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 to pay for their loss. Dear all, I'm very nice um, to be able to talk to you today. I am Marie Toussaint. I am a Green member, French member of the European Parliament, but I'm also a lawyer and an activist who has been fighting uh, for, well, more than decades now for the recognition of ecocide, but also for climate justice and the rights of nature. This all goes together. And I think this is the message that we are gathered here to send today. It is time to recognize ecocide. There is an emergency of sanctioning the gravest crimes against our planet. And this is of course linked to climate change. We are uh, leaving the 26th conference of the parties on climate change. And what we hear he here and today uh, from the youth, especially, and especially the youth from the global south, is that not enough is done in order to protect the climate. And the worst is that no one, neither the richest countries, nor the biggest companies and the most polluting companies, such as Total, for instance, and I will get back to that, are doing enough neither to prevent climate change and to stop their emissions, especially the fossil fuels, uh, but nor also to uh, 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 to pay for their loss uh, and damages for the damages they have been committed uh, for the last decades. And even uh, if we look in a more broad historical space um, since the Industrial Revolution. So we need to act now. And I'm very happy that we have the Fossil Fuel Treaty Initiative with us today. Um, also with the Stop Ecocide Foundation, who has been doing so much uh, for the recognition of ecocide. And of course, with the members of the Eco Ecocide Alliance of Parliamentarians uh, from all over the world that I created and I launched uh, more than a year ago uh, facing with the emergency. I'm very happy because we need to gather forces. Of course, climate change and ecocide are linked. Of course, climate change is uh, an ecocide. There are some punctual and very visible ecocides, um, such as the Deepwater Horizon uh, accident, for instance. But there is also a way bigger ecocide one that is really threatening the life of humanity, but also of non-human beings on the planet. And this ecocide is climate change. Only a few companies, public or private, are responsible for most, the almost integrality of emissions of CO2 uh, in the last decades, and even more since 1988 when we created the IPCC. They knew and they kept on developing fossil fuels. They knew and they kept on developing strategies to expand fossil fuels all over the planet and to lock us into this model. So right now what we need to do is to be able to prevent them for continuing to release uh, fossil fuels in the atmosphere. We also need to hold them accountable uh, for their actions. And for that, the recognition of ecocide is one of the best tools that we have. So we need to gather now. I was talking to you a bit before about Total. Total is known as the first uh, carbon major to know about climate change in 1971. 1971, more than 50 years ago. This shows that we could have done a lot differently than what we did. We could have saved the planet simply. Uh, so with the recognition of ecocide, we will prevent that from happening again. We will prevent companies, but also heads of states, of course, to keep with their um, destructive activities. So we need to do it now. And there are a way and growing number of states uh, who are entering in action. There is also a growing number of parliamentarians who are pushing their states 
to recognize and condemn ecocide at international level, but also at national level. And we have one big opportunity at the European level because there will be a revision of a directive which is dealing with the protection of the environment through penal law in the coming months, in the coming months. So we need to act now, we need to gather forces, we need to ensure that ecocide is recognized and condemned. And for that, we need to gather our forces. So again, I'm very happy that we are all here together today. I wish you a very good conference and this is only the beginning. Let's keep working together. Um, and so it feels a little bit like bringing the conversation home. We co-founded Stop Ecocide in 2017 um, as a response to the question, you know, how do we create a legal duty of care for the earth? And that was what Polly had dedicated the last 10 years of her life to. And in particular, this very precise initiative of criminalizing ecocide, or mass destruction of nature, at the highest level at the International Criminal Court with the idea of adding ecocide to the list of international crimes, currently genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. That campaign has grown from what felt at the time like a grassroots, very much a grassroots campaign um, to support diplomatic work. What we realized over time is that wherever the conversation around ecocide was coming to life, it was also getting noticed at the political level. And the momentum around this move to make ecocide an international crime has grown hugely over the last couple of years, and especially within the last year. Now, this is probably in part to do with the ever more evident um, apocalyptic events that we're seeing unfolding around the world in terms of fires and floods and weather events and deforestation and so forth. Also, in, in a kind of response as well to a civil mobilization around the world that has emerged as people begin to understand what's happening. And we'll be hearing shortly from uh, Andreas, who's worked with Fridays for Future in, in Sweden. Um, and the Fridays for Future movement has been seminal in this, as has Extinction Rebellion, uh, the Sunrise Movement, Stop the Mangamizi, these climate mobilizations around the world that have opened up the conversation in the media so that what we have been saying for many years is finally being heard. And we aim very specifically for the International Criminal Court for some key reasons. So I'll just set those out to give context to today's conversation. The first one is a kind of a practical legal reason, really, which is that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is the only global mechanism which directly accesses the criminal justice systems of its member states. In other words, if a member state of the ICC, and there are 123 of them, ratifies a crime of ecocide there, they will also have to include it in their own domestic legislation. So it's actually, although it seems like, you know, aiming for something that's really quite, um, you know, feels maybe distant, in fact, it can be very efficient as a method to change a ground rule in a coherent way that will apply across many jurisdictions. And that's very important with ecocide because the worst polluters, as we know, are transnational corporations that have the capacity to move from one jurisdiction to another. The second reason is also, also very practical, but in a different way. So, to criminalize at the International Criminal Court, to add a crime there, it takes a certain amount of time and it also takes a certain amount of momentum and um, uh, sort of collaboration between states. Now, what we're facing as collectively, as, as, <laughs> as the human race actually now, um, is an existential crisis. You know, this is a global issue and it is understood, felt and suffered in very, very different ways according to where you are, according to what culture you belong to and we'll be hearing more about that from Juma at my site. Um, but ultimately, this is something that is a planetary issue. We can't point over there and say to one company or one country, you know, that, that leak in the boat, it's at your end. <laughs> it doesn't work. And so we have to bring everybody with us. 
So moving forward at the international level creates a sort of safety in numbers, which is politically safer for governments to move with, to know that they won't be the only one making this radical move. It also means that it does take a little bit of time. And that is important because actually a lot of the uh, impact of this um, can happen in that space between now, between us talking about this in so many levels, in different sectors, in different countries, in, you know, with politicians, NGOs, grassroots, so many different people, and when it actually comes into play. Because that period acts as a transition period. When people can see it coming, they know that change is necessary. And if there's one thing that we've learned from all of these COP talks over many years, is that with all the goodwill and ambition in the world, we're still only crawling in the direction we should be sprinting in. And to create a hard stop parameter that actually steers a shift in direction, that puts a guardrail at the edge of that precipice, is absolutely essential if we're to really see movement in a new direction that's needed. And then the third and final reason is perhaps the most profound and long-term ultimately, which is that it can help to shift to criminalize ecocide at the highest level, it can help to shift a mindset that's very deeply embedded and that our legal system is built on, our administrative system is built on, and that is a, a, a mindset of separation where humanity is the dominant force and nature is a resource to be extracted. And in many cases, other people are resources to be extracted. It's, it's kind of the, the logical conclusion of hundreds of years of a very dualistic mindset, whether that's spirit versus body, whether that's you know, going right back to Plato, the ideal versus the real, and you know, more recently, the just you know, the ras rational versus the, the, the emotional, the nature of the body. You know, and this, this kind of duality, it runs right through our culture. And so our legal system is also very anthropocentric. It, it centers around humans and also around property. And the, uh, the, world, the natural living world around us is not given the same weight in law. And so the re relatively recent environmental body of law is not taken as seriously. But once we make ecocide a crime, we start to create a new balance between those, those two aspects. We all know you can't go to a government and say, can I kill 500 people for my next business? You wouldn't even think of doing it. But you can go and ask for a drilling license, a logging license, a mining license, a fishing license, all of these things that we know that at their worst create this serious harm. So it's time to start shifting that balance. And we believe that while it's surgically precise, ecocide crime has that power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jojo, for that very clear introduction. Now, we have a very distinguished panel um, of speakers, which I'll introduce as they speak. But the question that's been put to all of them is, how do you see the campaign for creating an offensive ecocide, and indeed the eventual creation of an offensive ecocide, how will that actually help your work? How does this interrelate to what you do? So our first speaker is Andreas Magnusson, who's a 17-year-old, uh, people must get very sick of their age always being listed, um, climate justice activist involved in the global climate movement Fridays for the Future and living in Stockholm in Sweden. So over to you, Andreas. Thank you. Oh, it's working. <laughs> um, I, I, I read the question first yesterday evening um, because I always do that, read it before the night because I don't want to know before um, what I'm supposed to speak about that because I think that if I'm prepared to say anything, uh, it isn't genuine. I think, I think that's a mindset that don't, people don't agree with me, but I do. Um, but I think when I read that question, I thought that it will fundamentally change everything. Because if ecocide is a crime, then my work will be very much easier. Because then it is illegal to harm nature. And if it is illegal to harm nature, then I don't have to fight against every system that is in place in this world. Then my work will be trying to get people to understand why I am doing what I'm doing, and not the the... What's it called? Criminal system. What's it called? Yeah. 
Yeah, criminal justice system. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I, I think if this, if we pull through this, then everything will be changed because it will be illegal. I th think I'm just just saying the same thing now, but it is. It's such a big. It's hard to grasp it because it's so big and it's so different um, from everything I've been working on earlier. Because now, for example, I'm working on a different project in Sweden right now. What's it called? The Aurora Process, and we are suing the Swedish government for their inaction on climate change um, and that they're not acting against the climate crisis. Um, and we we don't know if we we will succeed with this because we don't know if we have the criminal justice system with us or not. Um, so it is such a big difference from, from today if, we, if ecocide is a crime um, and my work will really just be about getting politicians to really do what they're elected to do. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to finish off there. Thank you very much. And our next contribution, contribution is Juma Zepaya, who's an indigenous leader belonging to the Zepaya people, uh, an activist and medical student from the Federal University of Para, and um, is the founder of the Juma Institute. And with Juma is Marcella Salazar, who's the executive coordinator of Health in Harmony Brazil and a council member of Institutio Socio Ambientella. Don't quote my Spanish. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my, my language schools are not what they should be. Um, but I think this is a perspective that's just so important. And a figure I learnt yesterday is that indigenous people are less than 5% of the global population, but control 80% of the world's biodiversity or in areas with 8% of the world's biodiversity. So I think this is a very important voice and I'm very interested to hear how Ecoside can contribute. So over to you, Juma. Obrigada. Boa tarde a todos e a todas. E muito prazer estar do teu lado. Muito obrigada pela tua coragem, determinação iniciativa de trazer um tema extremamente importante, porém muito ignorado. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here side by side with you and to you to bring a topic that is very important today and most of the time ignored. É preciso ter muito para poder encarar todo esse sistema de ignorar não somente os conhecimentos tradicionais, mas sobretudo o ecocídio. E para mim esse é um dos piores crimes contra a humanidade. So, sorry, um, it's necessary to be brave to protect the forest and to protect the natural environment where I live. Uh, and it's necessary to be brave to fight to turn ecocide a crime in a highest level. E quando você fala que o Tribunal Internacional pode levar um tempo para considerar um crime contra a humanidade e que precisa de provas, isso me preocupa muito. Quantas provas mais eles vão precisar? Eu não entendo. Porque isso é muito visível. Agora, o que me parece é que estão ignorando todos os fatos. E nós não temos tanto tempo assim. When you say that the International Court can take uh, some time yet to consider ex ecocide a high crime 
it concerns a lot. It concerns me a lot because we are out of time. Uh, what, what more they need to understand that ecocide is happening? What, what more proves they need? É inadmissível. Eu não entendo isso como justificativa. E é por isso que é importante que todos nós ecoamos a voz e dizer que o ecocídio existe e que é urgente e que precisamos unir as nossas forças, os nossos conhecimentos e exigir que não somente empresas, mas governos e somente esses, esses projetos que estão nos matando, que essas pessoas sejam responsáveis e que paguem pelo ecocídio. Um, I can't admit, I can't admit the ecocide uh, exists. I can't admit that is not considered yet a high, high crime. We must to scream more louder with our voice to do it. Sorry, I lost the last part. <laughs> Tem muita coisa que eu gostaria de dizer para vocês. Infelizmente, a gente não tem muito tempo. Mas eu vou dar o exemplo de Belo Monte, uma hidrelétrica no Médio de Ingu, que matou o nosso rio. E de Belo Sam, que é uma empresa canadense, e que está lá também, chegando no Brasil, para contribuir com o genocídio. E o genocídio, ele não anda sozinho. Ele traz o ecocídio com ele. There are many things that I would like to say to you guys, but I'm out of time here. I will give you some examples what is going on in my region, like where I live, it was built at Belo Monte Dam, a project that destroyed not only the environment, but many of the traditional communities, indigenous people, riverines, were affected and hard affected by this dam. And also another project, Belo Sun Mining, uh, from a Canadian company that wants to be installed in the Xingu River, causing like many, many problems, not only to the, the communities, but also to the environment. So, uh, what I see in my region is the ecocide walks together of, with the genocide, and it's difficult to, to separate it. Para mim, a discussão não deveria ser mudanças climáticas, e sim o ecocídio, que traz tudo. Não só a mudança no clima, mas a morte de fauna, flora e dos povos. Não dá para falar de ecocídio e esquecer dos impactos e, sobretudo, o silenciamento e ignorar os povos que vivem e que defendem a floresta com as nossas próprias vidas. For me, the discussion of climate crisis are connected, straight connected to the ecocide. We cannot talk about ecocide, we cannot talk about forest destruction without talk about the community's uh, destruction, about the threats that then traditional communities in the Amazon rainforest are facing nowadays. E eu fico prestando atenção nas discussões, em vocês. E vocês discutem clima, floresta, povos e planeta. 
olham, pra, olham de formas separadas. A nossa visão dos povos indígenas, somos uma coisa só. Não é a floresta, não é o clima, não é o planeta. Nós somos a floresta. Nós somos o clima. Nós somos o planeta. Enquanto tiverem esse olhar separado, nunca vão entender. Nunca vão entender o que realmente nós somos. E é preciso que vocês acordem. Acordem. É preciso que o Tribunal Internacional entenda que é urgente. É agora. E todos nós precisamos entender isso. Porque senão eles não vão nos ouvir. Okay. Um, you guys here, I, I, I'm listening to the many presentations, I'm listening to the conference uh, of COP26, and what I realize here, it's you guys discuss climate, uh, uh, climate separated from forest, separated from the planet, and always split it, like one issue not, uh, is not showing as a, a unit. So this all is not separated. This is all together, like climate, nature, traditional communities. It's impossible to, to split it. Like we are the forest, we are the climate, we are the planet. So why do we have this um, splitted visions uh, will be difficult to to have unit. Will be difficult to to unite everything. E eu fico feliz de ter pessoas como você e de vocês estarem aqui se interessando por esse tema. E é preciso que a gente traga mais pessoas, que elas possam entender, porque é isso que nós, povos indígenas, estamos denunciando há muitos séculos. E é por isso que estão matando, não somente as lideranças indígenas, mas as nossas crianças. Estão matando o nosso futuro com a tentativa de silenciar, de silenciar a nossa voz, Nós precisamos que vocês também entendam isso. I'm very happy to see you guys here fighting for this. It's necessary more people like you guys together with us. And because of this kind of fight, we are threatened. Uh, we we are trying, they are trying to silence us to, in this fight, like many of the indigenous people are being murdered in the way, like in Brazil, it's, uh, it's happening a lot of threatening and murder among indigenous communities. So it's very important to have this kind of support. Muitos falam sobre mudanças climáticas, mas poucos entendem. Mas nós que vivemos na floresta, já percebemos essa mudança há muito tempo. Muitas das nossas sementes, muitas das nossas ervas de cura, já não existem mais. Os nossos conhecimentos estão sumindo. Na verdade, não estão sumindo. Estão sendo roubados. Estão sendo tirados. E essa discussão, ela deve ser democrática, ela deve ser com todos e para todos. Nas escolas, na universidade, com os amigos. Precisa ser uma discussão para o coletivo, para a humanidade. Obrigada.
So many people talk about climate crisis nowadays, and we, the indigenous communities, the indigenous people, we are facing it from a long time ago. Like, there is a long time that because of the climate change, we lost herbs, we lost uh, seeds from our lands, we, sh we lost knowledge, uh, and I feel we were like stolen by the climate, by the society through them. So this discussion must be amplified and the echo side must be in, in the high court uh, and, and this is very, very important to uh, promote the conservation of our lands. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Juma. I think I know what I can say on behalf of everyone here and the people at home too. Thank you for bringing your testimony. It must be so painful to talk about, to reflect on what's happening. So we say thank you very, very much. Next, we're heading into a, a very different cult, uh, um, biological environment, somewhat uh, colder, uh, different kind of environment, different kind of society, but a very important perspective on this question of what ecocide can achieve. Our next speaker is Simon Holstrom, a member of the Nordic Council and also of the Finnish Parliament. And over to you, Simon. Thank you so much for that. Um, a little bit breathtaking, actually, by by, by this uh, previous speech. Um, I'm Simon, um, as you said, not from the Finnish parliament, but from the Åland parliament, which is um, a parliament in Finland. Uh, Finland has two parliaments, actually, um, which is autonomous part uh, of Finland. Uh, we celebrate 100 years of uh, autonomy this year. Um, and autonomy is the right of being different. Uh, we also see environmental degradation, but in other terms, the Baltic Sea being very, very sick is actually the sickest um, sea in the world. Did something happen? Right. Um, as, as we've been talking about here, the chain of, of, of damage caused by climate change and and the eco crisis. Um, I think Jojo pointed out uh, a word, apocalyptic. I think uh, I think it, it feels for all here. You know, we have some kind of feeling that it's surreal that we are in some kind of dystopy, that a Netflix movie. I mean, with all, all the actors in a, net, a Netflix movie, and we don't want to be there. <laughs> but we have to come out. We we have to do something in all levels, and I represent the political level, as I'm also a member of the Nordic Council, and the Nordic Council is um, um, a international um, corporation, uh, organization, um, founded by, by all the Nordic countries, that is Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, but it's also, um, it also includes the autonomous regions, Greenland, Faroe Islands, and the Orland Islands. And uh, what that institution does is to issue recommendations to the Nordic, uh, uh, Nordic countries and autonomous regions, uh, including, uh, um, including harmonizing legislation. And when I entered that institution two years ago, um, a new politician actually, I come from the activist uh, field, uh, from the environmental field, uh, I realized that nobody has discussed ecocide there. Uh, or hair, <laughs> uh, I realized um, that what was discussed, some you know, very specific uh, um, legislation, specific issues. Um, as we perhaps think about the Nordic countries, you know, front runners in the green transition, uh, pioneers in, uh, in technical development, 
Um, we have strong environmental legislation. We are model countries also to others. Um, yet that is not always true. Um, we, we often, we, we go here to COP, we have our pavilion here demonstrating what others can do. Um, however, we don't talk about our consumption patterns. The Nordic welfare system with good schools, with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, uh, health insurance and so on, is financed by overconsumption. And that overconsumption is exploitative, not only to planets, but also to indigenous people and, and um, exploiting human resources, really. Um, and that's, not, that's overlooked. And if you go to the blue zone in COP, you don't find any panels or sessions about um, the endless growth, the uh, root cause of the climate change, the root cause of, of uh, environmental destruction. So in, in um, last year, I, I, I met some other green-minded people in the Nordic Council, and we discussed uh, whether we should uh, do something about it from a Nordic perspective. Um, we were props up, of course, from the civil society by youth organizing events such as the Fridays for Future, um, who said that we should also discuss the criminalization of ecocide. So we submitted, I and a colleague, Rebecca Lemoyne, a member of the proposal, um, saying that the Nordic countries should, to the ICC, promote this and, and put it forward. And it was, uh, it requires quite some negotiations within our party, um, because uh, all the national parties, uh, political parties, are forming new parties on a Nordic level. We're a part of the middle group. And we all, we know that when we're putting forward very progressive ideas, very progressive proposals, then uh, we're able to get support from usually the left greens and the social democrats. Uh, when it comes to ecocide, people were very hesitant. Why is that? Why do we need it? We have legislation already. We are good, more or less. But nobody would like, you know, nobody wanted to say it out loud outside when media asked. So the member proposal has been discussed in a committee instead, you know, within closed. Uh, uh, it's been a closed setting. I'm a part of the Committee for Sustainable Nordics, uh, and I'm driving the issue there. We had a hearing with um, uh, a well-known um, uh, previous ad hoc ICC um, um, juror, and uh, he's working, Foster Pokar, uh, on a European level to kind of infiltrate the EU fee and legislation system uh, to make also the EU recognize ecocide. The EU Parliament has recognized it. And the EU Commission has said that all member countries should encourage, are encouraged to, uh, to promote it uh, on ICC. Encouraged. What is that? <laughs> it should be obliged. Um, so, what has been done, we've been doing some trickling, you know, having mini seminars and continuing to push the issue forward. Uh, that's usually the way you're talking about uh, very, um, you know, uh, very sensitive issues. You don't want to have a vote on it. You want to push it through, make people understand what it's all about. Uh, we're going to invite uh, the Stop Ecocide Foundation and other people to, to just um, raise awareness. And that's really, I think, the response to the question that you posed earlier. I think that's why we are needed. Um, because by campaigning, awareness raising, by infiltrating politics from the, for instance, the uh, Ecocide Alliance, which is formed by politicians all around the world. I'm a part of that, obviously. Uh, by doing this, I think we can make a sta statement that environmental legislation is not just fringe. It should be um, considered as constitu in a constitutional importance. And if we do that, I think many other things will be solved at the same time. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, our next speaker, Alex, I wonder if you want to move your chair over just so it doesn't kind of look like we've isolated you over there in the corner since we won't be using the screen anymore. Um, so our next speaker is Alex Raffalo, which has worked as a policy analyst, campaign organiser and strategist for climate justice for 15 years, including with the global campaign to demand climate justice, the Climate Action Network and 350.org. So Alex, some final thoughts on what we can do with Ecoside before we come to the Q&A. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much and, and thank you uh, for the invitation and to everybody who has been struggling to advance the cause um, of, of a new law of ecocide. Um, I'm from an initiative called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative, and we're a sister endeavor to try and enter into international law much greater focus on the fossil fuel system. So I thought that I would answer the question thinking about how the fossil fuel system and the law of ecocide activated uh, can reinforce each other to deliver the change that we're looking for. I would, Marie, in her first intervention, I think made several important points about the fossil fuel system uh, and its contribution to, to, to an alleged ecocide, I'm trying to be a lawyer there. I think we'd probably say definite ecocide, but you know, not proven guilty yet. Um, and also uh, Shulman's point about the way that ecocide and genocide go hand in hand because the fossil fuel system, and I'm using those words very intentionally, it is a, it is a system, and not only drivers of climate change. The fossil fuel system, the production, transport, burn, refining and burning of coal, oil and gas are not only the leading driver of the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and the biggest driver, you know, 86% uh, of CO2 in this last decade has come from these three sources. Um, that's true. It's overwhelmingly the largest driver of climate change, which is overwhelmingly, uh, I would suggest, uh, an example of the type of harm that ecocide uh, exists to prevent. But the fossil fuel system also causes harm and damage every step along the way. The production of fossil fuels um, in local areas uh, dispossesses uh, fossil fuels uh, in pipelines and ships, leads to um, spills and damages on scales uh, that also could contribute um, to a finding of, of ecocide. And uh, the burning of fossil fuels as a source of energy, not only contributing to the climate crisis, also contributes um, to uh, as many as five million deaths a year from air pollution. Um, there's, uh, the WHO estimated that as many as one in five deaths uh, could have been exacerbated and worsened because of exposure to air pollution from fossil fuels, and that it is the most significant threat to children in our world. So this is a system that is putting all of our lives as well as natural systems' lives uh, at risk. And when we activate the law of ecocide, we will look back and see that those who have profited from this system have known, they have known since the 70s, privately, not telling us, and then since 1988, very publicly in the UN system, uh, exactly what it is that they were doing. And yet they chose to persist with creating a system of production of fossil fuels uh, that underpin many national governments um, despite knowing this. So Jojo's reflection about a citizen's movement sparking a change that we need to protect our world is also very relevant because in response to this system, there has been an initiative which is the Fossil Fuel Treaty Initiative uh, of which I'm a part. You can see it at fossilfueltreaty.org, um, which is over 900 organizations across the world who are trying to promote a treaty focused on fossil fuels because the COP over there, the Paris Agreement, 
do not mention the words coal, oil, or gas. Do not mention fossil fuels. It's not a part of the conversation there. And so we get, just like Simon said, a lot of questions about, oh, what is that? Why do we have to do that? We, al we, already, have, we already have what we need for this, uh, to manage this problem. But actually, we don't. We don't have anywhere where we are agreeing to a new norm, a specific international legal norm that we cannot expand the fossil fuel industry, that we cannot license a single new mine, well, pit, drill for any more coal, oil, or gas. We do not have a negotiation anywhere to talk about how we phase down the production of those fuels, and we do not have a negotiation anywhere about how we are going to resource and support a just transition for the communities, the workers, their unions, and the countries most affected by this transition. Because there are countries, uh, particularly in the global south, where there is a dependency on fossil fuel income for the structure of their, their national accounts. It is not the case in the United Kingdom, but there are 400 million people who live in this world, who live in a nation state where more than 50% of revenues come from oil. We actually need to grapple with very seriously what the transition this decade is gonna mean for them. And so I think if we were to succeed in building a fossil fuel treaty and getting more countries to commit to these principles, what we would see would be further evidence of state practice, of uh, governing authorities, setting out the, the clear connection between fossil fuel production, the climate crisis. And that could serve as an evidentiary basis for charges and accountability of ecocide. And I hope sincerely that that is the change we'll see over the next decade. Thank you very much, Alex. And I have to sort of do a little procedural explanation here. Um, we have half an hour of this session to go. However, there is an event booked in this room immediately after us with no interchange. So we really have to be reasonable to them as well. So what I'm planning to do is take a round of comments, very, very short, and questions to our participants from the floor. Um, what's going to have to happen with that also is you're going to have to project from the floor as loudly as you can, and then so that people at home can hear, I'm going to have to summarise your question, so I shall do my best. But I do want to get some other different voices in here as well. Oh, okay, I'm told we now have a right roving mic, so you won't have to project, so that's good. But we, so if people can give me an indication, raise your hand if you're interested in asking a question. I can see here in the front row in the black um, here, and then I'll come to the other front person in the front row here, and then the orange jacket back there. So, um, in, and in the black, in black, in the black glasses over the, over the, there, the end of that row, thank you. Yep, and you may get enlisted. This is, we believe in cooperation. This is a cooperative eff effort in broadcasting. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for all of your contributions. Um, I applaud absolutely what we've just heard about the um, Fossil Fuel Treaty Initiative. Um, I have, however, a concern um, to know whether you could also support the fact that the nuclear industry also is an ultimate ecocide and the threat posed not only by um, nuclear power but the nuclear weapons which they're which there to support um, should be acknowledged as, as part of the reason we urgently need a, a crime of ecocide. Thank, Thank you very much. And the next question, if we can get the microphone to here in the front row with the orange um, lanyard. Thanks. I'm from Texas. Uh, I work uh, to stop coal, and we work against coal uh, mining and coal uh, power plants. Uh, my question is that International Criminal Court 
if we go to the eco side and it might bring hundreds if not thousands of cases all over the world so can we uh, file a lawsuit under the existing uh, law in the countries we work in the US uh, in the West Virginia and Texas the fossil fuel hub uh, other than Middle East. And we also work with a um, country like India, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. We're thinking about filing a lawsuit against an uh, Indian bank who is financing coal plants in Bangladesh. Uh, again, I want to make a comment on our uh, Just very Nordic quickly, friends. If you could, yeah. Is that we have to address the the core issue is the overconsumption. I work on coals, people work on uh, biodiversity, uh, ocean, plastics, it's all overconsumption. We have to address that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I can see the orange jacket and black mask there. Hi there, thanks very much, and thank you all for speaking. Um, so. The nation states of the world are guilty of genocide uh, and ecocide, and yet they're the people that uh, we're trusting to make the decisions to transfer to uh, a new system. We're making demands that they make ecocide a law. So I guess my question is, is at what point do we accept that the entire political infrastructure of our global society is corrupt and complicit uh, in genocide and ecocide, and when are we going to start coming up with our own alternatives to the United Nations and moving forward as citizens of Earth? Okay, we're definitely covering some ground here. I can see a blue jacket here in front with a white mask. Yep. And okay, I can, I'll come back to that side then. Hi. We're, uh, I'm a great supporter of the Stop Ecocide and also of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, we're familiar with the idea that when a crime is committed, there can be bystanders or people are not actually commissioning that crime, but are nevertheless implicated. So what I'm interested in is whether we, for example, to pursue the example that was given to us by Juma, in this country, consuming the consequences of extractivism in a place like Brazil, don't also come into this frame. The particular focus of my interest is, for example, soya that is being extracted from Brazil, which is being consumed in my hometown for the intensive poultry industry. Thank you. And uh, I can see um, in the middle, middle here, yes, black jacket. <coughs> All right. <laughs> Microphone's gone that way. We're going that way. Um, I'm from West Virginia. I have two questions that are fairly short. Uh, how do you legally define ecocide, and has the ecocide movement um, been at all connected with the push to pass green amendments in the U.S.? Okay, now I am going to definitely allow the um, black uh, jumper here in the centre coming this way, because I promised that one. That might have to be our last one, I think, realistically. Thank you. I think in, in, in order for, uh, we need to get people on board to support, you know, encourage politicians. And so the really important thing is to actually help people understand what just transition means. And I think we, it would be really helpful if, uh, I don't know about you, maybe you could answer this question. What does the just transition look like for those countries where 50% of their, their economic input comes from, you know, from fossil fuels? Well, thank you very much. And that was a huge range of questions. And I'm now going to give the panel an enormous challenge of each having two minutes. But I'm not asking them to answer all of the questions. I'm going to ask them to pick out to answer the questions um, that work for them or that speak to them or indeed that respond. So in a way, this is really a summing up with asking what you want people to leave with as well as answering some of those questions if we can, particularly the ones specifically directed to you. So I'm going to go to Andreas first. Over to you. Well, first of all, I'm terrible at answering questions, so <laughs> like a person in that way. Um, 
first of all, I, w I really wanted to, because I, I've been in activism for most of my teenage years, since I was 14, um, and, and, and in recent days, I, my, my only work is to uplift voices who is not white, who is not male, who is not from Sweden, but from the most affected people and areas. The, 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 those are the people we need to hear. Um, and, and as you mentioned, the Canadian company in the Amazon rainforest, that is the recent campaigns I've been working on, trying to un make people understand why we need to uproot the system, which is our slogan right nowadays. Um, because it is imperialist and it is colonialist to keep on having Western world companies extracting fossil fuels and, and taking the lands, which is yours, it's, it's not okay. And, and my job has been to work on that and try to get these people heard. So I really wanted to come on that. Um, and then I had a question on you in orange, uh, and and if I understood correctly, you asked, um, and what when are we going to accept that entire political spectrum is corrupt um, for not uh, <laughs> uh, because everyone is guilty of this, the eco side, um, and I think that's a brilliant question, and it's I think it's a brilliant uh, way to see it because everyone is in this. One who who lives in the Western world, who is from the Nordic, who is from the UK, who is from the US, we are part uh, of that system, and we're part of oppressing other people. Uh, and as long as we don't acknowledge that and do something about it, we're never going to see the change we, we need to see. So uh, thank you for lifting that, because that's important to bear with us that we have to do everything we can if we want ecocide to be criminalized and if we want a sustainable future and a just transition. I'm going to stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. <laughs> and next we'll come to Simon to pick up not every question, but some of them. <laughs> I think, uh, Andreas, you, you made some very good points. Uh, everyone is guilty because we live in a rotten system and we have to change the system, which is corrupt, which is corrupt in many ways. We have large economic, uh, strong interests from fossil fuel industry, but also under in other industries. Also here on COP, um, you mentioned when we were talking previously that these lobbyists, uh, they are when it comes to numbers, more, well, the largest one, the big delegation, if you sum these up, bigger than Brazil, actually. Um, and but they haven't got any pavilion. They're out there. They're mingling. They are having lunches and so on. And, and when I look into the Nordic countries, when we are trying to make a system change, when, uh, when Finland is uh, you know, legislated, uh, uh, legislating um, new climate law uh, with new targets, then Norway, all of a sudden, with a new government, announces more extraction. They will extract more oil and gas, uh, which really is, I mean, as a Nordic, um, a Nordic citizen, or part of Nordic council, when somebody all of a sudden does that, when we are actually agreed on being climate neutral together. Um, um, but, of course, uh, the world needs today fossil fuels, as they say, and Norway, this is their res response, Norway can provide the greenest, <laughs> the best fossil fuels for the world, better than Saudi Arabia. That's actually not true. The Saudi Arabian oil is more refined than the Norwegian. <laughs> um, but what we have to do, I think this is, this is my point, really. Uh, what we have to do is to unite from the civil society to to actually to to put pressure on politicians to change politicians and and to uproot the system as you said and that's the only way we can achieve a just transition because politicians as of today won't make it thank you very much Simon And I think since we're very definitely in the fossil fuel territory, I'll come to Alex next. Um, and I'll start with the, with the question around systemic change. Um, you know, we're, we're in a point of ecological crisis uh, as well as a, as a global equality 
crisis also of human needs uh, and access to energy for, for uh, a billion people in this world is completely insufficient. And so we know that any molecule of CO2 we put up into the atmosphere from today will need to come down. It will need to come down through natural systems, hopefully, but it means we need to stop putting new molecules up because we don't have enough natural systems to bring them down. So there is no silver bullet. There is no one way that we are going to do that. It's going to require a multitude of efforts and ideas and inspirations. And so there is not uh, one sweet trick that's going to win this struggle. It's going to require us to engage in different strategies and tactics uh, and engage with different people. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to pick the part of this struggle that connects with you, that connects with your, your heart, your soul, and, and use that to guide you into a political effort to focus uh, on the change you want to drive. And you will know the best way to communicate to other people because in the end, that's what the effort is. It's speaking and listening and communicating with others and bringing them into a shared understanding of the changes that we need to make. And our initiative is focused particularly on the question of fossil fuel production and particularly on the question of international cooperation to address a shift away from fossil fuel production. If that's your interest, if that moves you, get involved. But there, there are so many other ways that you can also do that, uh, in, including uh, on, on the nuclear issue. Um, we have a report uh, out uh, called the Civil Society Equity Review, uh, which I will talk to you afterwards, I'll be here. Um, which was released with the International Trade Union Confederation on that question of what the just transition needs to start looking like. But it's a question that we don't yet have good answers to, and we hope to uh, help generate those over the coming decade. Thank you. So thank you very much, Alex, and we'll come next to Juma. Interessant. Eu acredito que a gente tem um longo caminho que não é fácil e não vai ser fácil. Mas não adianta esperar que a mudança aconteça. É importante que a gente entenda que nós somos a mudança. Cada um de nós. I believe we have a long way, a very difficult way ahead. It's easy and hard at the same time. And it's important to understand uh, that we are the change. We cannot expect the change. We are part of the change. Os políticos não vão mudar as, as suas ações. Mas nós podemos mudar, fazer essa mudança. E ela precisa ser urgente. We cannot expect the politicians to change. They won't. Like, we must change. Like, we must lead this change, even to, to change the politicians. E essa mudança ela não vai acontecer somente na política ou com os leis. Ou a gente ficar esperando que o Tribunal Internacional entenda isso, ou entender que isso, que lutar por essas políticas, por esse, que esses crimes sejam reconhecidos, que isso é responsabilidade da Jojo, minha. E você? E vocês? O que vão fazer? Isso também é mudança. The change will not happen just in the polit political uh, system or just in the law. Uh, the change will we, we do not we cannot wait 
just to the international court to accept the ecocide um, law. Of course, we, we must push it, but what you gonna do? Each one of you, what you gonna do to change? Porque as mineradoras, não somente no Brasil, as indústrias que invadem os nossos territórios e que matam as nossas florestas, os nossos conhecimentos e sonhos, como a da soja, muitos desses produtos não ficam para os brasileiros. É mandado para outros países. O Brasil é, é um celeiro do mundo, assim como a África, assim como outros países subdesenvolvidos. Então, não adianta responsabilizar somente governos, políticos e grandes indústrias. Quem são os consumidores? The miners, the, the, the mining companies and other industries that kills our forest, that kills our people, that kills our dreams, they extract products as gold, soya beans uh, from the land, and most of those products came to, to here, go to abroad our country, and you guys are buying it. So uh, how, how could you change it? Quando ele fala que ele não tinha entendido o tema, o jovem, desculpa, esqueci o teu nome. É, Para mim é evidente, mostra jovens, as crianças, a sociedade, o planeta não entendeu a discussão e a importância que tem o ecocídio e que traz todos os tantos crimes junto com ele. Então a mudança ela tem que e ela parte de cada um de nós. Precisamos ser os multiplicadores. Isso precisa sair da boca de cada um de nós. Precisamos envolver as crianças e os jovens. Que eu sinto falta aqui. Precisamos democratizar a discussão. Senão não vamos ter mudança. Então, espero que cada um de nós sejamos a mudança que nós necessitamos. When the young man says that he doesn't understand so much the eco side, uh, she understands you, and it shows how the planet, how the people doesn't understand it much. Like... Uh, Juma feels a lack here in this room of youth, of children, like we must to make this discussion more democratic, not only for adults, uh, and we, we must be the change we want to make. Thank you very much, and from the chair, I'm of course not going to guess anyone's age, but I will point out that the 40% um, of the globe's population is aged 25 and under. I think we probably have a way to go to be absolutely representative on that as on other things, but something to work on. But I'm going to give the final word from the panel to Jojo, also reminding that there's um, the question about the legal definition of ecocide, if we can cover that fairly quickly. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you. Um, so maybe to start from there, uh, th this year um, a legal definition of ecocide was drafted by a top panel of international criminal and environmental lawyers from around the world uh, and a huge range of backgrounds from the International Criminal Court former judges to um, uh, activist people's lawyers such as Pablo Fajardo from Ecuador, a huge range of lawyers. And the definition that emerged from that drafting process was incredibly 
short and clear. And I can even tell it to you in one sentence, the core of that definition. So legally speaking, ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with the knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. It's been incredibly well received. It's very balanced between protecting from the worst harms, but also acknowledging the rest of the body of environmental law that's already in place in the world and differently in different countries. It means that if uh, taken forward in that form, and it's been acknowledged in the political world as being a very balanced and, and good starting point for a new crime, then it will reinforce all of the existing legislation. Now, a huge percentage, for example, of Amazon deforestation is already illegal. But there is no foundational piece that says if you break those laws, this is a serious crime, this is an international crime, it is fundamentally wrong. And that is something that, that um, this definition of ecocide really taps into. It draws forward everybody, everybody from those on the ground to those in academia, to those in politics who are working on changing and improving those laws because it will support all of those. And as all of those improve, it will become stricter and it will become more effective. And I suspect that, I mean, who can think of a nuclear bomb that isn't ecocidal? I can't think of one. So, you know, the, these, these aspects that have been brought up in these last questions will end up coming into those discussions. Um, and I think the other thing that I would just like to round off with is a very, very brief sense of where this campaign has actually got to, because I can almost guarantee it's going to be further than you think. Um, and it's absolutely true that the more people who are involved in this conversation, the more people talking about, the more ages, the more cultures, the more sectors, the louder this noise gets, the more the politicians have to listen. And that is our job, and that is beginning to happen. I'll give you two little examples. One is that we already have 16 member states of the International Criminal Court talking about ecocide at parliamentary or government level, sometimes both. And that is an extraordinary thing. That shows, and, and many of those have, have started that conversation since that definition emerged in June. And the second one is that it may be that the politicians get pushed from more angles than we think. Two weeks ago, the International Corporate Governance Network, which is a network of asset managers that between them control more than half the world's managed assets, huge banks like UBS, like BlackRock. This network of all of these asset management firms submitted a statement to COP26, to the presidency. And their recommendation to governments was to criminalize ecocide. Now, isn't that amazing? They're actually recognizing that a legal deterrent is needed if we are to move in a new direction. So I would hazard a guess that this is going to move faster than any of us imagined because it's becoming so clear now that this parameter is needed. It's not going to fix everything. As Alex says, we need so many tools, but this is a very precise and foundational piece that could really support all of the others together. And so I hope this conversation will continue to grow. Visit our website at stopecocide.earth. There are so many things in our Act Now menu. One of them will be for you. And talk about ecocide, because we know that where that word is being used, that is where the politicians are taking notice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jojo, and to all of the brilliant panel. I'm sure this is a conversation we could continue for twice as long as we have available, but we do need to vacate the room. I do just really want to offer one final thought from the chair, which builds on something that Juma said about people making a difference. The people in power who benefit from the status quo are not going to hand over change and not going to say, oh, yes, we can see you're right. Yes, we'll do everything differently. 
This is something we, the people, have to win. And if you look at all of the human rights legislation, all of the, the international standards that have been developed, even something as recent as majinsky style sanctions, which have developed from civil society campaigning, um, we have to go out and make this change happen. So I hope that's the message everyone's taking away from today. I think you could all join me in saying thank you to the wonderful panel. I'll say thank you to the audience. Thank you to everyone who's been listening at home. I think this has been a useful event, but it is only a start. This is very much part of an ongoing process. So I hope to see everyone here somewhere next along that process. Thanks very much.